Hello and welcome everyone to this open air webinar about um, open science requirements in Horizon Europe. Um, it's a one and a half hour session today, so rather packed agenda. And um, we are very happy to have uh, Jonathan England with us, who is from University of Luxembourg, and he'll kick off uh, the webinar with uh, requirements and tips. Uh, Julia Muller-Guarnera from Open Air will talk about Open Research Europe publishing platform. And uh, Pedro Principe from uh, Vienna University will talk about uh, Open Air services and uh, Argos and uh, Horizon Europe for DMP template in Argos. Um, and of course, we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. And uh, as you can see, we're using uh, Zoom meeting functionality. So please mute your mic if you're not speaking. And uh, if you want to speak, uh, you can unmute your mic, but we're many today. So perhaps raise your hand uh, if you don't mind, uh, then it would be easier for us to moderate. As it's a Zoom meeting, uh, we don't really have a Q&A functionality. So let's use uh, chat box for your questions. Sir and comments, uh, and you can also raise your hand if you want to ask a uh, question in, by speaking. Uh, we are recording this session, as you see, and um, if you don't want your video to appear in the recording, please turn on off your camera. And um, open air uses uh, open air underscore EU as a hashtag for open activities if you want to tweet about this webinar. And then if you don't follow us on social media channels, please do. It's open air underscore EU on Twitter. Then slides and recording of this webinar will be available on the open air website uh, in the webinar session. And um, welcome. And uh, it will be a very interesting session. So over to you, Jonathan, now. Thank you. Can you see the normal one or is it? Not yet. We need to stop because it's not there. Uh... And the display settings on the top menu. Ah, okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Great. Okay. That's fine. Perfect. Perfectly, Jonathan. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so today um, I'm going to mention the first uh, the requirements in terms of uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, I will also mention the uh, grant proposals, um, how to write, uh, to include open science practices in the grant proposals. Um, and um, yeah, we'll go through all of that. Everything I'm going to talk about is based on the documents that are listed here. So um, there's obviously the European Commission's um, own uh, documentation. And then also we have uh, open air guides that um, tell you about the requirements um, and they go much more into details about the proposals on how to write for each part of the, the proposal. Um, so I'm guessing that you all know what open science is in terms of the European Commission, um, open science is uh, they focus mostly on open access to publication, the normal one, also open access to data, um, following the uh, as open as possible, as close as necessary uh, principle that was also in um, uh, Horizon 2020. Uh, they insist all on the fair principles that I'll go back to uh, later on. Um, 
they also uh, insist on the uh, access uh, to results to be able to validate uh, conclusions, so any type of other uh, outputs that would be needed, um, and information about the tools, the instruments that need to be uh, to reuse or validate, whether it's the publication or the data. So first, we'll start about uh, publications. Um, the main important thing is that the European Commission, um, and you might be familiar with this, um, with uh, Plan S, um, though it, it is a bit different. Now you need to uh, put in immediate open access any publication as soon as it's uh, published. So no embargo period is authorized anymore. Before it was between six and 12 months, depending on the field. Now you, you're not allowed to have an embargo period. So you need to provide the at least the author accepted manuscript, which is the um, what I call the ugly version of your, um, of your paper. Um, and the version of record would be the, the editor's uh, version. So at least your version on, on the repository. I'll mention what a trusted repository is for the European Commission. Uh, you also need, that's the novelty with uh, Horizon Europe, you also need to retain your rights. So you need to apply um, a CC BY license. I'll go back to the uh, Creative Commons licenses uh, later on. Uh, you need to apply a Creative Commons license to at least your um, author accepted manuscript. So basically you cannot uh, uh, no longer um, sign the traditional copyright transfer agreement that was until now. Um, always remember also to add the, the acronym and the codes uh, on, on your paper because a lot of the time um, um, there are some um, uh, people forget to, to add that on, uh, in the acknowledgements. So you, you have no restrictions, and that's the biggest difference with Plan S, if you know about Plan S, is that you're not restricted in any way where you publish. Um, but in terms of covering the cost to publish in open access, you can only cover uh, those that are in full uh, open access journals. So if you have um, hybrid journals, we'll, you, wouldn't, you would still be able to publish in it, uh, but you would have to cover the costs yourself or go uh, different routes, uh, which is the uh, self-archiving routes. If you go for monographs, you can, the license is slightly different. So self-archiving is about depositing your uh, other, the author's accepted manuscript or the version of record on the repository. Um, and that can be, so in any case, even if you were to publish open access, you would still need to, to deposit it on the repository, but it could be sufficient uh, if you manage to, um, to have uh, your rights on the, the author accepted manuscript with no embargo, you would still comply and you don't necessarily have to pay for, for open access. So you can check the general's policy on Sherpa Romeo, and you can also use the rights retention strategy, which is basically um, a sentence that you would uh, put on your manuscript, on your preprint when you send it to the, um, to the publisher, saying that any author accepted manuscript that arise from uh, new versions of, uh, of um, the manuscript that would arise is under a CC BY license, which would allow you to um, to deposit it on a repository with no embargo and to retain your rights. Um, so just to cover briefly the author accepted manuscript the version of records, just to visually represent it, the accepted uh, version is, uh, but what I call the ugly version would be the author accepted manuscript. And then once it goes through the copy editing, that version might be um, under copyright to the publisher. If you paid uh, article processing charges, usually even the version of record 
is under an open license and you retain your rights. So you would also be able to deposit. It really depends which route you ended up going um, to. In terms of uh, research data, there's a bit more differences than uh, Horizon uh, 2020. Um, you need to be in line with the FAIR principles. Um, you need, I'll, I'll explain that in, in a second. Uh, you need to create a da um, data management plan uh, by month six. You have to update it uh, mid-project and at the end of the project, or as often as uh, necessary, but that's the requirement, minimum requirements. You need to deposit your data as soon as possible after production, um, but you are allowed to have, for data specifically, you are allowed to have um, some sort of embargoes as long as, for instance, you're waiting to uh, publish the, the results. However, the metadata, which is the, um, the data sets, the name of the data set, the author's name, um, any uh, unique identifiers, uh, so your unique identifiers and ORCID ID, a DOI, which is the unique identifier for the data set, um, the license and all that. All, those, uh, all that metadata needs to be deposited on a repository as soon as it's produced or generated. Meaning that as soon as you've uh, completed an experiment or the study, or you would need to upload that uh, information to tell the world basically that you've produced some data. The data itself can be closed for now, but uh, it has to be at least uh, uh, visible online that uh, it has been generated. Um, so as I said, you have to deposit on the repository uh, um, openly, that's the default as soon as possible, but um, you have the principle of the European Commission, which is as open as possible, as close as necessary, and you need to uh, justify why you might be closing something. So you don't need to explain why you're opening something, but you need to explain why you don't want to be opening, because the default is that you should open um, data and publications. Um, yeah, in terms of the licenses, uh, the metadata needs to be under um, CC0. So it's a license that, um, um, I don't know if it's the next one. CC0 is basically that um, you don't need any attribution anymore um, to, um, to the, um, you don't need to cite basically the, the office. Whereas the CC BY that I've been mentioning so far is an open license that you can share, adapt, uh, whatever you want, but you have to credit the, the office. Um, and again, as with the um, publication, you need to provide detailed information about any um, other types of um, outputs, any tools, instruments, that are needed to either um, open the, uh, the files, uh, reuse them, validate the data, so any types of software, algorithm, protocols, um, anything like that that is needed for, by others. So basically, you need to think that another researcher should be able to just open your data and um, know what to do without the need to contact you. Um, the European Commission is quite specific in terms of the valid justification for not opening the data. Um, mostly it's in, in anything commercial. So if you could do, uh, if you could exploit any of the results uh, commercially, um, then you might, um, um, you might um, justify that it needs to be closed. If obviously in terms of uh, privacy or sensitive data, that's obviously always a, a legit um, reason to close. 
and they are also very specific in terms of security rules that would affect directly the uh, European Union. A trusted repository is, um, I wouldn't say complex um, um, thing, but basically don't get too attached to the certified repositories, which can be a bit confusing with all those uh, core trust yield and all that. It's just for information. Basically, what you want to, to know is that the European Commission does allow you to uh, deposit on any repository that is well known in your field. So um, that's, you know, from within your research community, there will be uh, certainly some um, um, specific repositories. Or you can always use a general purpose repository such as uh, Zenodo. Um, you can use other ones, but they need to um, abide to the, uh, the specificities of uh, what the EC um, outlined. So I'll mention the Creative Commons. It's an open license, so it removes any um, doubt into what the users can do uh, with your work. So under the Horizon Europe grants, um, the publications are in CC BY usually. So as long as you cite the or the authors, anyone reusing um, your publication cites you, then that legal um, framework. And for the data, it's recommended to go for CC zero. But obviously, the best practice is always to cite the the authors. But Legally, they don't have to. Um, there are reasons for that that I'm not going to today. Um, and just to be clear, it is universally recognizable and it is a legal framework. So if someone was to reuse some of your publications on the CC BY and not cite you uh, and claim it as if it was theirs, you could go through uh, legal um, copyright infringements. Okay, so I mentioned uh, previously the uh, need to create a data management plan. Some of you might have already been uh, creating one. It's a living document because you create it within the first six months and then you update it at least uh, twice more. The difficulties with the DMP is that um, there's no absolute right answer. Um, as long as you're clear and you justify everything, you can, in theory, do whatever you want uh, with your data or process the data or share the data however you want, but you need to justify. So for instance, if you wanted to use a commercial company to store your data that would be stored in, um, in the US, for instance, in terms of GDPR, uh, you would need to justify that this company is compliant with GDPR and therefore um, that's uh, all right. Um, things like that, basically, that you, there's no right or wrong answer, but you need to really justify to the European Commission why you're using such tool, why you're using such methods, why you're not opening the data. As the, the more detail you are in the DMP, the less issues you will have um, because you don't want the, um, project officer basically to dig for, for information. And what I always say to, to researchers also that you know already all this, this is not an, really an admin um, document in itself. It's more laying out to the funder that you actually know what you're doing because you've already processed all that in your head. But what the funder is now asking is for you to officialize it and put it on, on paper. I also mentioned the FAIR principles. So if you've never um, looked into this or heard of them, then you'll need to look a bit more. Um, we have some guides on, on open air. Um, the, pr the principle of FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So data can be FAIR, but not open. Uh, but data should always be uh, fair, even if it's closed. So what that means is that it always needs to be findable. 
So as I was saying, the metadata needs to be uploaded on a repository so that people can actually know that it exists because you might have a great piece of uh, data on your computer, but no one would know about that. It needs to be accessible in a way that uh, it can be limited access with a specific uh, grant, uh, granting access. Um, so the thing that we see a lot where um, someone would say, oh, it's available on request, that wouldn't be an, a, an accessible, um, uh, it wouldn't be accessible under the FAIR principles. Um, and that's why we deposit on repositories. Um, and for approval is basically using as much as possible open file formats. Um, so Excel files are the most common ones you would um, save as CSV, for instance. Uh, all those are um, best practices that you need to learn um, and contact the, uh, the people at your institution or on the OpenAI website to get more information about those best practices in research data management. And reusable is basically, can anyone else actually understand what's going on in your data set? So you need documentation. Usually it's the readme file that will explain all you know all the different fields um, and all the different variables and also there needs to be a license attached to it so that people know exactly what they can and cannot do with with that data there are some specific cases is that even if you close the data the uh, the ec might still require you to open it to specific people under an, um, an agreement and confidentiality agreement. With COVID, uh, the EC also implemented these public emergencies cases. Uh, so if the EC triggers it, uh, you need to provide immediate open access to res every research output, so not only just publications. Um, you need to provide the DMP as soon as um, as soon as possible, basically, with the, the grant proposal. Um, and if you need to provide also open access to, to, to data, if there was a conflict of interest, so as I said, you know, whether of those cases where you would uh, restrict, um, you would embargo basically the, the access to the data, um, you still need to provide a non-exclusive uh, license uh, to those legal entities that would need uh, that uh, research data to, uh, for that emergency. And that can apply up to four years uh, after the end of, uh, of your project. Um, but it is temporary. So if whenever you will grant that non-exclusive license, it would be for limited uh, time. Um, in terms of reporting and monitoring, I want to emphasize that the European Commission has said that they would be, they will be much more, uh, much stricter and much more vigilant at um, all these open science practices in Horizon Europe, because it's it is one of the pillars of Horizon Europe. Um, so they will check much more and monitor that you're respecting uh, all those requirements. Now I'm going to briefly mention the grants, the grant proposals when you're writing. Um, it's difficult to cover everything because um, there's a lot of details within the the um, the, um, the documents provided by the um, the European Commission. But basically, when you're writing your grant proposal, they are. Um, different parts that uh, where open science needs to be explicitly mentioned. So in the application form, so in part A, you will need to list, um, now it's not just five publications anymore, it can be any type of uh, research output. So it can be any software services, data sets, publications, obviously anything. Um, and I'll go back to, to that because there's other restrictions on how, what, the, what type of publication and data can be mentioned. 
And in terms of the technical description, so in part B of the project proposal, um, there's three different areas where um, it needs to be mentioned. If you want more information about uh, like really go into detail, obviously you have the documentation of the European Commission, but also on the open air guides, uh, they go to from, um, in detail for each uh, section. So I'm only going to mention uh, some general um, advice. So any publication that you cite uh, as part as you know in part A as one of your five um, outputs needs to be in open access. Um, open access without embargo, actual open access and on a repository. So it needs to follow the, the same requirements as uh, Horizon Europe requirements. Um, the European Commission is a signatory of the DORA declaration, meaning that they will not evaluate any of those research outputs based on uh, the impact factor, for instance. So it's only on the qualitative side of the um, um, of the um, publication. Another advice I would give is you can also give um, some insights into where you're hoping to publish. Uh, it allows you to say, I will publish in Open Research Europe, which um, will be mentioned later on, which is the, um, the European Commission's um, publishing platform. Uh, or I'm going to publish in this and this journal, which are full open access journals, for instance. Data is the same, it should be fair. So all the data set that you might cite as one of those five outputs in part A needs to be fair. So it needs to be on a repository in open or needs to be fair at least, um, but accessible to the, uh, to the people reviewing your, um, uh, your, um, your grant application. Um, in the grant proposal, there's no real DMP, data management plan required, but you have to provide uh, information that is very, very similar to a DMP, uh, like the type and the size of the data, any uh, persistent identifiers um, that you will attribute, like the UIs and the licenses. So it's kind of basically like a mini DMP that they're already asking you. Um, and in Horizon Europe, you now have to have a distinct work package called project management that will include the DMP as a deliverable. Um, as you probably know, um, open access costs or article or book processing charges are eligible. But as I said before, only if they're full open access journals or full open access uh, platforms. If they're hybrid journals, you cannot, you can still publish in those, but you have to cover the costs in a different way. Um, things to consider uh, data curation costs. Um, so if you have big data sets or if you need to um, do anything on the data sets that you know won't, you won't have time and it's worth uh, investing money for having a data curator, you can include those costs in the project proposal. And it's good also to put, add those costs because it also shows to the funder that you actually thought about how much work it will uh, required to process that data and publish it and make sure that it's fair and all that. So not only you can, you're eligible to put it in your budget, but also it's kind of showing uh, that you, you know what you're doing. And everything in terms of uh, engagement with open science um, and um, uh, citizen science would be also um, eligible. As I said before, be as specific as possible in your grant proposal, same as for the DMP. And uh, be careful because sometimes when I review DMPs, uh, some people will explain what open access is or open science and all that. 
the the project officers or the the people reviewing your your grant proposals know what open access open science fair data is you don't need to, you can go straight to the to what exactly uh, how your data is going to be fair um, a few special cases uh, for so the ERC and the Marie Curie um, grant proposals. So in ERC, it's um, good to know that there's no explicit evaluation of open science practices, but if you do include it, and I would highly recommend doing so, it will increase your chances of, uh, it will increase your score basically um, to, to include it, but it will not negatively impact your score if you don't include open science practices. Um, ERC projects do not have scientific work packages, but this in Horizon Europe, you will have to have the research data management work package with that data management plan deliverable. And the ERC also has have their own DMP templates. Uh, Marie Curie is very much um, uh, emphasizing on open science. Uh, it represents 50% um, of the evaluation of the um, part of the award criteria. Well, it's not the only in, in the excellence criteria, but the excellence criteria weights 50% and one um, the open science practices is one of those uh, excellence criteria. And also you need to provide um, information about which type of training activities and including also in the career development plan, um, any transferable skills that uh, are linked to open science practices. And that is um, for all Marie Curie uh, actions. So whether it's the um, staff uh, transfers or the postdoctoral, any of them have to have, um, have that. So that's uh, for me right now. And now uh, Julia will talk about the Open Research Europe. Thanks a lot for all your questions. We'll address them in about uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes talk. Thanks a lot, all, all great questions. Julia? Yeah. Sorry, just uh, okay. Uh, I was um, I was muted. Just a second that I'm uh, sharing my screen. Um, good morning, everyone. For those who join uh, later, it should be this one. Okay. Perfect. Um, so today I'm going uh, uh, to present you Open Research Europe that as uh, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, explained before, uh, it's uh, the platform of uh, the European Commission dedicated to publication. So it's uh, like substituting uh, the classic uh, journal. Uh, Open Research Europe is uh, uh, one of uh, the two instruments that uh, um, the European Commission is providing. Um, this is uh, in particular for publication. The other infrastructure um, that uh, the, Open, uh, the European Commission is providing is uh, EOSC. So going back to uh, Open Research Europe, uh, also called ORI, uh, it's a publishing uh, platform platform uh, in which you can submit uh, the original uh, articles in peer review. Uh, what you are uh, publishing is uh, uh, whatever is funded by the Horizon 2020 and the Horizon Europe. It's providing uh, open access um, since the beginning. The copyright uh, uh, license uh, is enabled uh, to reuse all the contents. Uh, all the open science principles are applied in uh, the um, publishing platform uh, and so also the open peer review. So the name of the reviewers, the revision, the comments after the author revision are all openly available. Uh, moreover, it's uh, hyperconnect and available to text and data mining. Uh, so it 
enables to be um, to comply with all the fair principles already automatically. So you don't have uh, uh, to uh, store in another repository or uh, enrich the metadata. Everything will be automatically done by the uh, editors and the platform itself. Uh, there is also a new generation matrix. Um, so whatever is uh, downloadable or cited uh, uh, will be available in the platform. It's clear, accessible, transparent uh, on publication policy and process that you can find in the OER website. It's aligned with the European principle and the regulation. And uh, um, it's uh, an example also for uh, other founders. How does it work? What is the editorial model? In the Open uh, uh, Research uh, um, Europe, uh, when you are submitting an article, it will uh, uh, go to preprint. But before, actually, in this passage between the article submission and the preprint, there is a, a strict uh, editorial checks. Uh, because all the editors that are part uh, of uh, or are uh, native speakers, so they will check the language and they will check uh, the article before the preprint. So it shouldn't be that scary as uh, uh, a lot of researchers are thinking. There is a very serious uh, process here on the editorial side. Then the preprint is published. Usually uh, within uh, uh, two weeks, maximum one month uh, between uh, the article submission and the preprint. Then uh, uh, there is uh, the uh, peer review process in which uh, experts uh, that can be suggested by the authors uh, are uh, called uh, to provide feedback on the paper. And uh, uh, after uh, uh, the peer review is done, uh, it will be uh, published the second version. All this process is uh, publicly available and uh, is uh, completely transparent. So in the preprint uh, example, you will see how many views, the loads and citation there are. It's possible uh, to, to, um, to redesign the preprint. But uh, it's always uh, uh, written, uh, awaiting for peer review. Um, the DOI will remain the same, uh, the DOI. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, everything is uh, linked um, and easy to follow. Uh, after, uh, you, after the paper is revised, you will see the version usually it's not arriving to the fourth uh, uh, to the fourth version. Usually, it's uh, or it's uh, the second or the third, but it strictly depends on the review um, comments. So if uh, it's read, uh, it's uh, it's fine to be reviewed. And uh, uh, how many invited reviewers are there? Everything will be transparent and open. And also it's good because it gives uh, the visibility and the credits also for reviewer who are contributing in uh, the uh, research um, of the grantees. Uh, open peer review example uh, um, are uh, exactly like that. So you uh, can open in the, in the right uh, part, if I go back. Uh, you can open all these review that are uh, listed here. Everybody have uh, the ORCID associate if you want, or if you don't want, you want to publish it. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, the uh, comments from the reviewer and then uh, the responses from the authors. And then you can see all the uh, amendments uh, uh, in the various uh, version. Uh, the open data example um, are uh, also within the uh, are part of uh, the system. So if you are producing uh, uh, new data or using new data, there uh, there will be asked to um, to provide this kind of, of the information and link with uh, the data sets uh, 
that uh, that you have already published and uh, um, to give the right uh, uh, creative commons on licensing uh, in the data sets where you store then all the information available. Uh, you can also link uh, the softwares and the codes. Um, the Open Research Europe uh, is not uh, discipline specific. It means that any kind of research areas can publish uh, in, uh, in uh, Open Research Europe and all the costs are covered by, already by uh, the European Commission. So there are no uh, costs on top. Um, Policy and editorial guidelines can be specific in uh, science, technology, and medicine, social science, and humanities. And you can publish uh, any type of article uh, that uh, can be support uh, dif different uh, discipline areas. Uh, so as you can see here in the table, so you can, uh, um, you can publish also essay, case studies, uh, brief reports, uh, even data notes methods and protocols. Uh, you can uh, um, uh, write also a register reports, a review, and uh, any kind of, uh, uh, of uh, studies uh, that uh, you can think about. <clears throat> OK. Sorry, it's blocked. So now uh, I will uh, I will go to a publishing experience because I was a Mercury individual fellow before uh, joining OpenAir, uh, and uh, here there were the reason why uh, personally I published uh, uh, in uh, Open Research Europe. Uh, for me, it was uh, to follow all the, the principle of open science without uh, being scared that uh, it was not fully compliant or not. Um, the fact that, that there were uh, new metrics uh, that uh, could comply to the research assessment and be much more aligned to the uh, policy of uh, the European Commission. Um, I was happy that uh, uh, F1000, uh, who, is, uh, um, who is supporting this platform, uh, uh, was one of uh, the um, uh, assigned the DORA principles and uh, uh, they have include everything, uh, every principles in the editorial practices. And then also that it's very easy to link uh, uh, in the tender portal. So when uh, I had to report my publication was very easy to do that. Uh, it's very easy to use for uh, the researchers because you can link directly uh, with the ORCID. You can uh, um, assign which is the article type. And then you follow uh, basically a very, very easy um, template, which is uh, two page. So it's very, uh, very easy. And uh, each authors is following the credit taxonomy. So every authors have the correct uh, uh, accreditation. Also the review uh, was, uh, uh, is uh, quite easy. Um, so you publish the first version in preprint and then you go with the, the first peer review, which can be approved or approved with the reservation. And after that, when you were reached uh, to peer review, you can uh, start to upload the second version. Uh, it's also good uh, for uh, the Horizon uh, beneficiaries uh, to be part of uh, the reviewer, because at the moment there is no fully credit, but uh, um, but uh, the research assessment discussion that it's currently in uh, inside the uh, discussion of the European Commission uh, on a research assessment uh, wants to value the um, the work of the reviewers. And that's all. I'm happy to answer to your questions, if there are any. Thanks a lot, sir. We also have Jonathan's spot. So maybe uh, let's, let's finish Jonathan's slides and then we'll take questions. Thank you so much.
keep switching. Sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> um, I see room two. So I talked about the requirements uh, so far, and uh, what I'm going to talk about now are the recommended practices that the European Commission also mentions for Horizon Europe. So all the things that I've mentioned before are the mandatory open science practices that will impact negatively your score if they're not uh, addressed. But there are also some recommended uh, open science practices because as you know, open science is an umbrella term that includes a lot of uh, things. Uh, if you will, uh, if you include them in the grant proposal or even in general in the uh, in the um, in your project, it will um, positively affect your your score, but it won't impact it negatively if you don't include them. So there are some uh, lists that is mentioned um, in the template, but uh, it's a non-exhaustive uh, list, obviously. So in terms of what the recommendations are, they talk about early and open sharing of research. So talking about preprints, uh, pre-registration, registered reports, which I'll explain in a, in a second, um, participation in open peer review, such as participating in Open Research Europe, um, and uh, involving more uh, the um, other actors, uh, so more the, the public, so in um, public engagement, public outreach, and um, citizen science, for instance. So I'll go through um, all the various definitions um, in case you're not familiar with, with them. Um, but ultimately, there are things that you'll, if you're interested, you'll need to maybe dig a bit deeper and see how that could fit your project within the grant proposal. So pre-registration is basically the fact that we've seen, you know, the um, reproduci reproducibility crisis um, with the um, up to quite recently, the way that we were evaluating research meant that uh, you were kind of forced to, well, not forced, but it led to a lot of um, bad uh, research practices like um, uh, data dredging and uh, postdoc um, uh, theory, theorizing, postdoc, uh, um, all those type of um, bad research uh, scientific practices, basically. Um, so pre-registration is the fact that instead of publishing your just your results, you're also going to publish uh, the methodology uh, and the question, the hypothesis, and the, um, uh, everything that goes uh, with it, so that you can basically also claim in advance that um, that um, uh, that uh, methodology or that study, uh, even before doing it, and um, it ensures that people know that you were um, not just guessing afterwards um, from the results, but you were actually uh, you had thought about that question beforehand. In some domains, you have uh, specific procedures, uh, such as in cl clinical trials, which are quite uh, advanced in that, um, since we're talking about human, uh, human trials. Preprints is, you might have heard about it. There's, um, so traditionally, um, you know, the way that peer review works and the way that traditional uh, publishing works can be quite time consuming and slow. Um, and so preprints is a way to speed up the process in which the, you're sharing your results. So you're sharing the non-peer reviewed um, version of your work and then on, on the preprint server, and then it will get ultimately uh, peer reviewed and published, uh, whether it's through an um, publication uh, platform like Open Research Europe, 
or through a normal uh, journal or publisher. Um, and that allows you to have um, an increase in um, visibility, not only, especially important if you're an early career researcher um, or if you're doing longitudinal uh, data, um, uh, data research, that can, uh, that can help a lot. Public engagement and citizen science is also very important. Uh, it's emphasized a lot uh, more and more by the, uh, by the commission. Um, what the commission wants to see is, an, well, it's not specific. So, so all what I'm saying now is kind of my interpretation or our interpretation of what the commission wants. They're not putting it black and white. So. Um, what public engagement means in general is that you're trying to do more public outreach to try and democratize, democratize uh, science in, in general, to make it more approachable. And so that can take many different forms, whether it's giving talks to the public, uh, giving talks or workshops in schools or in cultural centers, using social media so you can use your, your platform to, um, to do, um, um, uh, scientific uh, outreach, um, any TV shows, documentaries, you know, all those type of things. And within the European Commission, there are two specific um, uh, projects that uh, might interest you. So Science is Wonderful is for the Marie Curie and European Researchers Night is also uh, from the uh, European Commission and it happens every year. So you can have a look also at that um, to maybe include that in your grant proposal or even at a later stage uh, during your, your project. Citizen science is a bit more specific in the way that, uh, that it's going to involve research. It's going to involve, sorry, the public within the research project. So that can take many uh, forms. So it can be just, um, data gathering where the uh, like bird watching and I mean it's probably one of the most uh, um, well-known example bird watching um, for citizen science um, but it can also involve um, members of the public coming up with um, um, with uh, research questions um, collecting the analyzing the data uh, so there are a lot of um, examples. I just gave uh, a couple of ones like Zooniverse, uh, Galaxy Zoo, if it's probably the most well-known citizen science project where uh, members of the public are um, asked to um, identify galaxies, basically. So they're analyzing the data. There are also um, some school projects uh, to um, uh, warn people of any um, earthquakes. And there's even examples of being included in um, big uh, franchise uh, video games um, and many, many more examples of that. So that's also something to consider because you might have a very, um, your research might require a lot of uh, data analysis. And so maybe you might benefit from uh, involving the, the public. And that's something that's the, um, as I said, is not, if you don't do it, obviously it's not going to impact your uh, score negatively, but if you do include it, then you will have more chances of, of uh, getting a positive um, uh, to, to get the, the grants. So just to finish um, on all this before we go to questions, some of all tips is to really think about what strategy you want for your project in terms of open science. Um, while you're designing your, your grant proposal, while you're designing your, uh, your project, even in the future, think about that strategy for all of your research projects. Um, do include very specific, um, very specifically, so be precise uh, what, uh, where you're going to publish the, the, 
the data and your publication, who's responsible for this. So that's also part of uh, that uh, data management plan, but do be precise about all this. Um, then obviously um, update uh, as much as possible um, all those um, strategies. So it's not because you come up with one strategy that it has to stay forever. It's um, you, you can, I mean, obviously research is always unpredictable. So you might have to change some things. And that's why I was saying that the DMP is a living document because it's not because you started with a question that uh, uh, methodology that you have to uh, continue with that. Then obviously it's uh, flexible. So your open science strategy might change based on those changes. So update it and give uh, regular reports uh, through the, the platform. Keep track of any issues that you have, discuss it with other people, be as collaborative, as open as possible. And um, yeah, those are the overall tips that I can give you. Um, and now we have time for some questions. I know that there's already quite a few that were put in the chat. Um, so I'll let you now. Thank you so much. So let's take them um, in the order of appearance and uh, perhaps some of them could be merged because they are along similar lines. So Martin was asking, uh, are DMPs still reviewed by external experts which has by the project program officers. Uh, and then Mauro was saying, I was about to write the same question, who is going to verify that what they've written in the DMP is true and what happens if they find that it's not true. And Kirsten was writing, does AC review the submitted DMP and provide feedback for improvement? Can indeed DMP be disapproved? Uh, and I guess we, we already answered that, that it's a project officer and reviewers who read your DMPs and uh, they discuss DMPs with, with you at the project review meetings. Uh, so that's a way to monitor them. Uh, and I don't know if there is anything else to add on that. I, I guess the only thing I would add was to the question, who is going to verify uh, that the DMP is true? <laughs> Ultimately, it's, uh, well, responsible research practices. Obviously you can fake your data if you want to, but you'll get caught at one point. And I don't think that's in the interest of, uh, the, the DMP is really not there to be an issue. It's um, more to lay down exactly that you know what you're doing. So if they, if you have doubts or so, if there's blanks in your DMP, that's fine. You, you can actually say, I actually don't know where I'm going to deposit yet. And that's perfectly fine, but be transparent. So as I said, there's no right or wrong answer as long as you're transparent and clear. Thanks. Clara was asking, should data management plans be deposited and accessible along with the data sets? It is recommended, um, but it's not mandatory, yes. And Naeem was asking, how does the European Commission evaluate fairness in data? And then there were some questions later on. Uh, does the European Commission uh, have a rubric to evaluate DMPs? And um, it's basically uh, European Commission uh, Horizon Europe DMP template is structured around fair data principles. And that's how they evaluate DMPs. So the questions are basically our data stored in trusted repositories and uh, things like that. So basically a DMP structure is used to review DMP template and um, thanks a lot uh, Marina for posting links to DMP rubrics uh, in the chat. So uh, what European Commission has is along those lines. Maybe the only thing I would add also is, and I think you've um, put that, uh, Science Europe is that group of funders that discuss all this. Um, they, they discuss the fairness and all that. So they're always improving in, in how they're evaluating. Um, so the, it's, they're not just on their own. They actually discuss with other funders and other group of experts how they should be evaluating um, 
the, the projects in general. Christina was asking, um, should all data produced within a project be uploaded in a repository or is all data needed to validate the results in the papers published within the project? Um, that's a good question. I would say that um, all the data should have at least the metadata, because as I said, as soon as you create data, you have to add the metadata. Um, there might be different reasons why you don't share the data, because if something went wrong in an experiment, for instance, and the data is not um, uh, valuable in any way or non-usable, then there's no real um, interest in sharing that data. But if you create a data that you're, you end up not using, but that could be valuable for other researchers, then yes, uh, I would put that also in uh, on a repository in open access, um, because you use the Horizon Europe funding to create that data. And so it would fall under that. Um, so you have to separate really research data and um, publications now. It's, Obviously, there's to validate the publications, you want to have the data sets available, but data sets are publications in themselves now. So anything that you create needs to also be um, as open as possible. Thank you. And a question from Katya. Good morning. Thank you for the presentation regarding Marie Curie action. What examples of training activities and career development plans can we suggest researchers in the context of open science? Any tips on that, sir? Jonathan and Julia? That's a very good question. <laughs> I'm sure I have plenty, but right now. Uh... <laughs> There is a, a special uh, section of the Marie Curie action that is dedicated to the training. So eventually you can uh, contact directly the project officer if they have uh, uh, some uh, specific suggestions. Uh, what uh, um, is currently available is that uh, um, there is also the network of uh, the Marie um, Curie Alumni Association that is providing uh, some uh, specific courses. At the moment, uh, is, there is nothing uh, strictly related to open science, but uh, we are thinking to work on a specific uh, curricula for uh, the Marie Curie, um, for the Marie Curie um, alumni. Um, and maybe Pedro, I don't know if you have uh, some other specific information. Uh, no, 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 I don't have, I don't have only the, the those resources that usually are used. I remember that they used a lot of the, um, the ones from available in Foster Open Science. So we, we can still suggest there are some courses, even if some things are a bit outdated. I know that uh, Marie Curie alumni still use that and uh, the beneficiaries from Marie Curie um, and, and others, <laughs> but I remember that they were quite active using those materials from Foster Open Science. We can put the link in the, in the chat. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm just thinking, for instance, something where you're doing um, science communication, a workshop on science communication would be valid, a workshop on how to um, manage your data properly, even a webinar. You know, this type of webinar could also be considered as uh, this kind of things, but um, there's probably many more, but um, that's the base would be webinars, for instance, and workshops. Thanks. Next question from Andreas. Jonathan mentioned on his slides that DMP must be a part of the work package project management, but it can also be a part of uh, scientific empirical work packages. Hence, uh, where the main research data is being generated or not? If I'm not mistaken, it has to be a separate work package nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, I might, uh, don't quote me. Uh, mm. That usually it's part of management work package or even a separate work package. But I, I believe, yes, it's, it's a specific work package called um, research data management with deliverable DMP. 
yes. but uh, we will need to, to double check that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Thanks. A couple of questions about publications in hybrid journals. Um, you stated that costs for hybrid journals are not eligible. Could you please give us more information? Then another. Yeah. And what do you mean for hybrid journals? So maybe if you could explain that. Uh, yeah. Um, so there are some publishers that have uh, journals where you have to pay an open access fee to publish in open access. Those would be full, what we call gold open access. There are a few less, but which are better ones where uh, they publish open access without you having to pay and as an author which we call diamond open access. Um, but a lot of the journals nowadays, uh, what they do is they will have a subscription um, model where libraries, for instance, or you as an individual need to pay to read part of the paper uh, of the journal. But some, they also give you as an author the opportunity to pay an APC to publish in open access, meaning that the journal has a mix of the author pays and the reader pays, and that's hybrid, and that's a problem because um, it leads to what we call double dipping, where you have um, the authors, um, you, as a subscriber, you're basically kind of paying twice um, because some of those uh, um, articles are already in open access, but you're still paying the, the full price. Thanks. Then a couple of questions about Open Research Europe. Hannah Laura was asking, how is ORA ensuring that usage stats are not gained, robots, etc.? This is uh, not a question that I think it's uh, more for the technical uh, uh, team of uh, Open Research Europe. Yes. Yeah, but but I can again give a tip if you allow me, Julia, because it's a, yes. the service is compliant with um, the counter rule of practice. So as uh, the, the other um, facilities of, of publishers, so they all follow uh, a code of practice that is in fact the international standard. Uh, so this uh, the the user statistics from those kind of services follow this code of practice, which. Uh, provide some kind of um, um, quality insurance or certification to this kind of uh, figures numbers. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. A question from Georg, also on Aura. Will there be metadata that links preprints to the final version of articles, as well as metadata that links peer reviews to final version of preprints to which they pertain? Uh, yes, the link uh, actually um, what uh, what is uh, very clear is that uh, uh, you can see all uh, the, the, the process till the end. So if uh, all the metadata are modified and reached, uh, you will see in all the versions. So at the end, the final version should be already the one uh, um, enriched. Um, but everything is uh, available in uh, the work process, including the metadata information. I can go also other to the other question, which is, uh, are the editors of uh, or uh, publicly mentioned and therefore our knowledge? Not at the moment, but we can suggest uh, to do it uh, for transparency reason. Regarding the indexing, yeah. <laughs> can go on. Okay. Regarding the indexing of uh, ORE, at the moment the um, the first indexed was with the DOIG. Um, they are uh, um, since the start uh, they um, were going in deep to other kind of uh, index system. But uh, to reach some standard, it requires some time. Now that uh, we already are after one year, um, they are uh, currently in the process to be indexed. Okay. 
Then, Anna Laura was writing uh, a question on semantics. Uh, a record in order before peer review is it a preprint or submitted article? I think it, we can call it both. Both. <laughs> The landscape is changing. <laughs> and then uh, all re reviewers are not paid there. About number of citations uh, to all the content are provided only via cross ref. Uh, I guess yes, but we were not 100% sure. Yes, I, I can share the link if uh, someone wants to go in deep in the information. Um, and uh, you can uh, you can check uh, the various link. And name is asking open communication and peer review process can result into a conflict between an author and reviewer. How do you solve such situa situations in our publishing process? I haven't really heard of any conflicts and I guess open peer review is a way to have a constructive dialogue like you would have at the conference and not that conflict. But I don't know if colleagues could um, answer that uh, yeah i really oh. think it i'm oh, sorry yes no go 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 ahead no 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 go ahead <laughs> uh so if um, if there are any conflict of interest you can uh, already stay uh when it suggests to the reviewer um because what usually is asked by the open research europe platform is that uh, the authors are uh, uh, suggesting the reviewers and they have to state if uh, there is any conflict of interest. Moreover, uh, the review, uh, the reviewers, every time they do uh, open peer review, they can ask to the editors if uh, there is something that is appearing. I've seen a revision in which uh, the, uh, the, the peer reviewer was mentioning that uh, he had uh, some previous uh, discussion with uh, um, some previous work or they know uh, the, the authors personally, but uh, they were trying to address all the comments in a way that uh, it was not uh, uh, affecting the, the quality. But if there are some kind of uh, strange, uh, um, strange uh, situation, uh, the, the editor is called uh, to uh, find a solution or find uh, new, um, new reviewers. Thanks. Better two more questions, and then we'll we'll hand over to you. Sorry about it. Kirsten was writing, uh, in what way do you suggest information about other research outputs needed to validate results uh, should be provided in the repository, in a separate documentation file or in a metadata field? So I guess a good practice is when a readme file is available that provides this information and then if, if there are metadata fields where this information could be included, that would be useful as well. I don't know if yeah, it really depends on how complex your your data is. And so when I'm sharing some um, <clears throat> learning materials, for instance, sometimes I may put the um, licenses within the readme file because I cannot put that in the metadata. So the metadata of the data set is in an open license, but then within the readme file, you would find each license, individual licenses. That's just an example. So it really depends on a case by case basis. But um, usually in your institution, you would have um, research support staff or librarians that can help with um, to answer those kind of uh, questions. No. Antonio was asking what is the procedure to sanction non compliance to these requirements? Uh, so I saw examples when. Uh, Funding was cut because uh, projects were non-compliant. Frozen, frozen the, um, the funding in the reporting period, and waiting to for feedback from the researchers. So we this is one of the this is the main activity that usually the, the project officer does. If they check that um, there is like zero publications in open access or something like that, they frozen the reporting period until there is um, a change of procedure or a justification. Thanks a lot, and over to you, Pedro. And if we missed some of the questions in the chat, please yes, write them again. 
yes, we will try to address them in writing or at the end, I will try to do my best just to do these highlights uh, in um, 12, 30 minutes. Um, so what, what we want now is just to highlight some of the services functionalities available in the open air services to support Horizon Europe projects, to support the researchers, to support the project coordinators in terms of delivering uh, the MP, depositing publications, uh, link publications or data sets to, to, to the project and report it back to the, to the European Commission. So um, highlighting some of the materials that we have available, uh, point, you, uh, point to you to the um, Horizon Europe template available in Argos, the tool to deliver and prepare data management plans. Uh, pointing to you the facilities that uh, you have in Zenodo, a repository to deposit publications and data, and also the claiming service where in explore.openair.eu you can in link publications and data sets to your specific uh, project. So data management plans we already talked about, so it's a formal document explaining um, uh, how you are going to handle the, the research data through the data life cycle. It's mandatory in Horizon Europe. Uh, um, it's, it's also placed in different national open science um, requirements, policies from national funders. And it's becoming um, also a, a practice uh, in different uh, universities for PhD uh, students. Usually you present the structure of the DMPs based on these six areas where we, have, where you, we can have a summary of the data description, where we can have um, the way that uh, the, the data will be documented and, uh, and describe it, so documentation and metadata. So policies for storage, for um, backup, for uh, uh, so the practices of, of this area, and then legal and uh, the questions related with legal and uh, ethical issues, the way that uh, the project will address them data sharing practices and also the policies for long-term preservation and then uh, location of resources, costs, uh, people in charge of the different uh, um, responsibilities within the research um, data life cycle. So those that are correcting that, etc. And a bit what we have in the Horizon Europe template is also, also integrate these six areas that the DMP should, should have. There is a template available in the documentation that is also incorporated in the Argos uh, DMP tool. Uh, what is important to say is that the, 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 the data management plan in Horizon Europe needs to be delivered in the first six months of the project, the initial DMP, and then you can have, uh, we need to consider as a living document, is the commission really don't want this as to be a kind of bureaucratic exercise that you deliver the document and is done. That is something that you continue to update. You can have one or more updates during the project. It depends on changes in the research, changes in the consortium, different uh, reasons. And then you also have it as a final report. And uh, it's important to say that the, the reviewers of this project will also assess uh, the data management plan. There are tools that, okay, they are kind of assistant tools uh, to facilitate our life. There are several tools available in online applications. Um, some of them are simple forms just to simplify our lives. Others have um, uh, wizards with, uh, with uh, detailed guidance on each of the areas to prepare the, 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 the data management plan. And some like Argus from OpenAir is quite rich in terms of uh, machine readable uh, data management plans, uh, which clearly differentiate Argos from, from other uh, tools. Of course, there are some institutions that already indicate the specific tools or tools that are more used in specific research uh, fields. Argos is a generic uh, tool available for all. Just to finish this introductory part, uh, one important remark, this is what we really want from the researcher's point of view. So examples, data management plans that we can see, um, uh, what others, what other colleagues from our area or from other disciplines prepare in terms of a DMP. So 
You can find lots of DMPs in Zenodo. In fact, in zenodo.org, if you search for data management plans, there are lots of, uh, of, of, of data management plans as reports from specific projects uh, published there. You can also check in the Argos because there is a part of public DMPs. And there is an interesting, the, the National Open Access Task from Open Air in Austria did a very uh, good work. Uh, and there is also a page that the, the link is, is available in the here in the slides that you can access for different um, a collection of different uh, data management plans that can be useful for you for you they are from horizon 2020 projects but uh, so in terms of um, structure of the dmp it's similar to the horizon europe uh, template so just uh, two or three highlights related with with argos that is a tool that you can use it's free to use um it's a, it's online uh, of course people also can this is also an open source software that can be installed in a, in a facility in an institution but to be aware that uh, it's a, it's a, it's free to use and it's integrated in the um, european open science cloud uh, um, uh, services catalog um Two or three things, I, I, two or three highlights from the functionalities. Uh, there is a possibility to create the MPs in a collaborative way. So it's quite easy. Someone started the MP and shared it with other logins to access and to edit uh, the, the MP or to just to revise it. There are several different templates that you can use. Of course, uh, the, from the EC, Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe are available. Um, you can export the data management plans in different formats as a document, a PDF, but also in other way, ways like uh, JSON, for example. And it's integrated with several different uh, APIs, integrating different kinds of information from PIDs, from authors, until list of projects, list of repositories. So it's really, really rich service in terms of integrating uh, different um, tools. Key features just to highlight you some interesting uh, points for this assistant tool. It's important to say that there is a difference between um, the, the DMP and then the description of data set. The, the uh, DMP can integrate different descriptions for different data sets. And this is really rich in terms of what we, we want to, to, to deliver from this tool. Of course, it complicates a bit because it put it more complex, but it's really a benefit for the project itself because sometimes the project really release um, uh, different kinds of data sets, completely different in terms of the organization, in terms of the data collection procedures, etc. So it's good to have this difference. Um, the other, the other highlight is uh, that uh, easily at the end of the process you can get a digital object identifier uh, for your DMP, and in can you can in fact. Uh, um, mind the DOI, DOI for different versions of your DMP as for the initial version and for the, the different updates that you are going to, to deliver. Um, we will look into, into the, the, the uses of this uh, tool, but uh, you can see that there is uh, in the DMP basic information a way for you to identify your project and identify the template that you, you want to use, Horizon Europe. Um, and uh, the, um, there is a template with the structure of the template fully available and quite well uh, described and with the um, detailed guidance for each of the topics that you see here, the, the, the descriptions, the fair practices, the allocation of resources, security, ethical aspects. So they are all available in this uh, in this um, tool. Uh, so um, this is not an assistant tool; it's much more than that. Because as we are using Argos embedded, incorporated in the open air infrastructure, uh, the DMPs that you can deliver can be easily linked to other kinds of research outputs, to publications, into into data. Will be also available in the. Um, in the European Commission uh, uh, participant portal. Uh, so we, we made it available for different actors in the open air infrastructure, which is really 
interesting. And there is a connection between uh, Argos and Zenodo. So at the end of the process, if you decide to publish the DMP, you can publish it directly in Zenodo. And there is a possibility to integrate with other repositories uh, at the institutional level also. To finish, um, design machine actionable uh, uh, templates and the, the machine actionable facilities that there are in Argos are really, really important. This is what differentiates Argos from some of the other tools because we integrate different uh, APIs, different um, uh, information, sources of information, um, IDs, persons identifiers from organizations, from authors, etc., which make also very rich um, in terms of um, input types and, 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 and semantics. So let's just uh, check uh, one highlight. So uh, you can access in argos.openair.eu. It's free to use. You just need to create a login. There are different ways for you to, to, to create a a login from from uh, your account from from using a Google account etc. So you uh, need to create a, a data data management plan. Uh, when you create a data management plan, you will be guided to identify the main information, the funding, uh, and the, uh, not currently, but this is what the, we are working on. So the list of the entire list of projects from, from Horizon Europe are not yet available in the open air infrastructure. In fact, we already have it in our backend, was something that we were pushing a lot to receive it from the European Commission. Finally, we have it. And soon, on the coming week, this will be available in the open air infrastructure, will be available in the Explorer, Explorer service, will be available in Argos, will be available in, the, in Zenodo. So all the demos that I am doing now uh, will, will, will be made available uh, soon. So you can indicate the project here. And then uh, after finalizing these first uh, four topics, uh, you um, will identify the uh, data set template that you want to use. And this is where you have, you will find Horizon Europe template. So, and all then uh, for each data set, it can be only one or it can be two, three, four, depending on the structure of your, of your project and the way that you are collecting data. So you can identify, uh, describe um, the way that you are going to manage uh, the data for each uh, data set. So you have uh, all these topics to cover quite well documented okay uh, it's it's a long list uh, so um, don't um, be afraid to explore there are lots of uh, explanations useful links so you can start delivering preparing your sorry preparing your data management plan uh, being uh, um, supported by the guidance that that we have there are lots of uh, integrations like like i said uh, from different uh, for different tools and you can describe it and it's, it's quite uh, easy to use of course it's a bit complex but there are several fields to fill of course you can uh, discard some of these fields but it's quite well documented this uh, um, um, template okay uh, this Argos really simplifies your uh, your life. Uh, it's really a support for researchers and for project coordinators and simplify a lot the administrative uh, process. So uh, last uh, three minutes, uh, just I, I wanted to uh, have from you to highlight um, four main things that you can also benefit in the open air services. Uh, to support deposit of your research outcomes, and to support the reporting to the European Commission in an easy way. Open air relies on the, on the mantra that uh, is deposit once, reuse multiple times. And this mantra is quite important to facilitate researcher life. So you can find where to deposit in explore.openair.eu. Uh, and if you don't have an appropriate thematic discipline or institutional repository or a CRI system in your institution, you can uh, use Zenodo. And Zenodo is available uh, for, for, for everyone to, to, to use. So um, you can search in, uh, in, uh, in this page and identify if your, uh, if your um, 
repositories available and if it's compliant with open air or not so it's easily i'm like i'm sharing my own repository if you don't have an appropriate repository you can uh, deposit uh, using zenodo two highlights the first one is the size of the the records that you can upload so until 50 gigabyte which which is so quite uh, easy for publications but for data is quite also uh, very supportive uh, important to say that uh, all the projects are listed in the um, in in Zenodo also so you can easily when you are describing your publication or your data set there is a specific field for you to um, identify your project like this publication that it was from fit for ri and horizon 2020 project you can easily identify the funder and then uh, search for uh, a project and then uh, save and this information will be visible and automatically available in open air and automatically visible in the uh, participant portal from the european commission uh, in open air, the second highlight that I want to do is that we have, uh, as you can see, we have uh, um, almost uh, 140 million uh, publications already available, but there is a landing page for each uh, project, okay? If you search for your project, if it is an Horizon Euro project, search next uh, on the coming week, okay? If you search for an Horizon 2020 project currently in Horizon Europe in the future, you will see that there is a landing page for your project where all the outputs are gathered and those outputs will be suggested to the participant portal for reporting purposes. So for example, this uh, example from On Merit, it's an Horizon Europe, uh, Horizon 2020 project. You can see all the publications, research data, and you can also see the, the DMP that was prepared for this uh, project. This is a, a very good way to gather all research outputs. It's important to say that the list of projects is part of the open air research graph. And we also test mine publications. And we, if we find uh, in, in using our test mining algorithms, a link between publications and projects, you, we will put it available also in, the, in, in our infrastructure and visible in the explore.openair.eu. So this is important. And for the fact that we have this list of projects, so different repositories, institutional repositories can also, like this one from our university, can also easily identify projects in, in, in when depositing publications like I demo already in, um, in Zenodo. Last highlight is a really useful tool that we have in OpenAir, really, really useful. And it's quite well uh, uh, used a lot, uh, we know, because uh, when it comes to the reporting, we have last minute deposits, we have last minute, uh, um, we, we the project coordinator uh, um, identifies that uh, several research outputs are not yet properly uh, linking to the project, etc. So this service is available for you to link a publication or a data set to a specific project and to claim a publication. So in explore.openair.eu, if you use the linking uh, service, the linking facility, you need to be uh, logged in, of course. You can search. Uh, so, and when you search for a publication, you can search for a specific DOI or can you just search? We are searching automatically in the entire graph of OpenAir in the cross ref database in data seat or even in Orchid, okay? Uh, let's take an example of a real DOI that uh, from a data set that it's not yet. Um, you, you search for a DOI and you will see that in data seat, there is the metadata of this um, record, okay? Data from a survey. This data was deposited in University of Minho data repository. It's not linking yet uh, to the project that uh, uh, this data set belongs. So you can uh, claim this public this data set to the specific project. Okay, if you want to do more, you can do add more and then finalize the claiming. Let's finalize the claiming. You just search for a DOI or another query. 
identified and then you can continue to link and then you will say, okay, I want to claim this publication for my project or to linking to another research result. This is good if we want to link a data set to a publication, for example. But we now, we want to link it to a, an Horizon Europe project. In this case, I will demo with an Horizon 2020 project. So I identify that I want to link to a specific project. Then I will search for the project, okay. Um, I will identify the project and then, oops, I, I don't need to click. I will click in plus and then I finish. Uh, okay, this data set now will be linking to this specific project as an output from this specific project. This is quite useful as several repositories don't have the facilities to, to provide this metadata information and to do the linking. So we can easily do it and we can finalize. As this is a real example, I, I'm finalizing this link, uh, which is uh, this will then will be made available also in the on merit uh, web page because I did the link for the, the on merit. Important to finish, last thing participant portal. So I show you that it's, there is an easy way to deposit publication. There is an easy way to identify projects through data sets and to publications. There is an easy way to claim if this is not properly uh, described in your uh, repository. And then you can easily do it uh, in, in the participant portal. In the participant portal, uh, if you, uh, let me see where is okay for the reporting period okay session expired you will see that in the tab publications uh, open air suggested publications and then you can easily click unfortunately my my session is expired but there is the same for the open data tab so in the publications tab and in the open data tab all the publications listed in the project landing page in OpenAir will be visible here for the project coordinator to select these publications and report it to the European Commission. And with this, we close the, the, the cycle, the, the, the circle, and uh, we close the cycle, uh, and we, in fact, use this mantra of depositing once and reuse it uh, multiple, multiple times. So, and with this, uh, I'm, I'm finishing my, my presentation, just highlighting that we have three new guides related with Horizon Europe. Uh, so we just published last week and this week, they are available for you uh, to, say, I, uh, to, to, to check. I hope this will be useful for you. Uh, guides on how to comply with the Horizon Europe mandate for publications and for data, and also a guide uh, to support you on the preparation of a proposal uh, when it comes to the open science requirements. Thank you so much, Pedro. That was excellent and a very good tip about linking. Uh, that, that's really a unique service. Okay. I don't see any questions, just thank you messages and uh, Okay, perfect. It's a real hand, hands on. I'm so sorry that uh, you had to rush. No, no problem, no problem. It's normal. So we, we have replied to all the questions. What are important are the questions from the participants. Yes, I hope this demo is useful. So the recordings will be made available for people to check later if they, they want. So maybe last minute to add any questions. And if you need to leave, uh, feel free to leave. Sorry that we went over time and uh, slides and recording will be made available on the webinar page. Uh, to link once again. That's a page where slides and recording will be available. We'll also have uh, a blog slash new site on the open air website about that. Um, Yes. And feel free to contact us if you have any issues um, playing with the tools that we just demo, accessing helpdesk uh, at openair.eu. We are changing the helpdesk service, so this will be, if you send an email, helpdesk uh, at openair.eu, uh, this will be um, registered in a new ticket system that we have, so it, it will be easy for us to, to reply and to, and to follow up with your requests, so don't hesitate to, to put questions. Okay, so Irina, there are no questions, I think. No questions. Um, Once again, I dropped a link uh, to the feedback form uh, if you could add 
some suggestions for other topics that we should be covering and provide any other feedbacks that would be very useful. And thanks again and uh, have a good rest of the day. Yeah. See you at other open air webinars. Bye-bye. Excellent speakers today. Bye. Thank you.